On today's show, we talk about glue. We get started on the F100 and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. Promotional consideration for Amazing Plastic the Scale Model Show is brought to you by Tenet Controls, makers of scale model lighting systems. Tenet Controls brings models to life. Visit them today at tenetcontrols.com. And by Vallejo Acrylic Paints, with a wide range of highly pigmented colors specially formulated for models and miniatures. Vallejo Acrylic Paints sold at hobby stores worldwide. And by Model Land Limited, specializing in radio control and scale models. Our store may be small, but our inventory is huge. Visit them today at modelland.com. Welcome to Amazing Plastic, the Scale Model Show. I'm your host, Richard Cleveland. On today's show, it is jam-packed. We're going to check in with Jay Barron from Evil Duck Creations. He's going to be showing us a little bit about molding. We're going to talk a little bit about the different glues that you use while you're building your scale models, as well as my good friend Alex Johnson had dropped by to learn a little bit about how to build his first model kit, and we get started on the F100. So stay tuned, all that and a whole lot more. But first up, we've got the news. Well, let's check out some news from around the web. iHobby Expo recently wrapped up, and I got to tell you, there was some great stuff that came down the pipe, uh, including from round two models. They are repopping some older kits and revamping some older kits in the Star Trek line, including the bridge model, which now comes with more figures, more walls, a little bit more accurate to what the actual studio set was. So if you're interested in getting yourself a classic bridge, now's the time to do it. Uh, as well as they're re-releasing the exploration set, which if you were a kid and you had one of these back in the 70s, they were awesome because it came with the tricorder, the communicator, and the phaser, and you could build them yourself, paint them up, and pretend that you were part of a landing party and get out there and play with your friends. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Now, the kit is not very accurate in terms of the pieces that are in there, but they're still a fun piece to have. Uh, they are also re-releasing the Enterprise E. So if you didn't get a chance to get that the first time around, now's your chance. Uh, Ravel of Germany has re-released uh, the, ex- uh, pardon me, the Voyager, um, and that model is coming down pretty soon too. So make sure that uh, you look into calltvman.com for all the latest news on what happened at iHobby Expo and pre-order some of these kits or maybe get some of these kits already. Mobius Models, uh, just before we wrap up uh, the news from iHobby Expo, also uh, showed off some of their models that uh, they'll be releasing very soon, and one is already out from the Battlestar Galactica line. This is from the original series. They showed off the Viper model, which is the Mark I. They also had uh, the BSG um, Galactica uh, full-size model and the Cylon Raider. Now, the Cylon Raider and the Battlestar Galactica model have not been released yet. They are due to be released fairly soon, so keep watching for that. You can, Again, you can pre-order those um, or get on the watch list to make sure when they do come down the pipe and they're available that you can get yourself one. It looks like they're going to be fairly reasonably priced in between about $25 to $35 uh, with the exception of the Battlestar Galactica, which I think might crawl up to around $55, $60, but they're still well worth it. These models have been retooled and redone so if you're a Battlestar Galactica fan and we haven't seen these models again in a long time and now that they've been updated they're well worth having and uh, they're a lot more accurate as well. Chris Kleinsmith is putting together a uh, tribute build for Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy uh, if you're not familiar with him was a writer and did books like Clear and Present Danger, which was turned into a movie, as well as The Hunt for Red October. He's done tons of video games, or a, a lot of video games. Sam Fisher, a character uh, that some of you may be aware of, 
from the Splinter Cell uh, group of games, uh, all based on his writings. And he's putting together a tribute build, which I believe is going to end sometime in 2014, early part of 2014. So you have a lot of time to build your model that would be based on some of the vehicles or some of the things that you may have saw either in the video games or read about in the books. So if you want to get in, get in touch with Chris Kleinsmith, you can contact him through Google Plus, and you can also go over to our community, the Amazing Plastic, the Scale Model Show community on Google Plus, and you can find him over there as well. Just drop him a message. I'm sure he'd be happy to tell you a little bit more about what's going on over there. Um, we also want to tell you about a brand new charity build that Amazing Plastic in our community is going to be doing. Now, this charity build is uh, designed to be uh, for everybody. And what we're planning on doing is this is going, the money raised is going to be going to the Jimmy Fund, which is a cancer care facility for children. So we really want you to participate. And I'll tell you a little bit about what the rules are. You cannot pay more than $20 for the kit. Now, that doesn't mean that the the tag on the kit has to be $20. You can apply coupons. You can apply uh, any kind of discounts that you can, as long as you did not pay more than $20 before tax or shipping for the model kit. That will make the kit eligible for the build. What we want to do is get a lot of people involved. Um, you cannot buy any aftermarket parts. You can only use what you have on hand. Now, glue and paint and that kind of stuff, is an exception. You may have to go out and buy colors. We understand that. But what we'd like to do is get all all the community together to build a model. We're going to start auctioning them off in uh, April. We're going to build a specific site just for this. Now, we're raising funds, as I said, for the Jimmy Fund, which is a kids' cancer care facility in Boston. And uh, we really want to raise a few dollars for them. We're going to auction them off. Bidders are responsible. Winning bidders are responsible for paying the shipping. The person who has built the model is responsible for shipping that model. If you want more details, check out our website on Monday. All the details will be up on the website to tell you a little bit more about this charity build which starts January 1st and ends on April 1st. So make sure that you go and check out all the details on Monday over at AmazingPlastic.com, our website. So that's all there for you. Now, let's start getting into some stuff. This week's Google Plus Community Spotlight is on Nick Ambergy. Nick built a 1929 Ford Rat Rod for a contest that he entered on YouTube. It's made up of two different kits, some parts, box parts, and some are scratch-built stuff. He had a lot of fun building this, and it was built in around 60 hours over the course of two weeks. Now, the kits he used was a 1929 Ford pickup from Ravel. It's a 125th scale. He used the body from that kit. And from a Chi-Town Hustler Dodge Charger, uh, which also was 125th scale, also from Ravel. Out of that box, he used the engine, the wheels and tires, rear end, scratch built some parts, uh, had the chassis, exhaust headers, hinged bed cover, grill, dipstick, steering box and links, changed drive to the passenger side, uh, dirty ding- danglers and nuts, and used a mixture of testers and Tamiya paint along with sophisticated finishes for rust effects and rust. Now, the cons that he had on this was he had no directions, and we celebrate Nick's Rat Rod here on Amazing Plastic. Enjoy. My good friend Alex Johnson dropped by the studio to learn how to build a model kit as we got started on the F-100 project. So I'm here with my good friend, Alex Johnson. Hey, Alex, thanks for coming by today. Hey, Rich. Thanks for having me. Hey, man, it's uh, it's good to see you back in the studio. It's been a long time. It has. It's been a while. You know what? I really like what you've done in the place. It looks awesome. Thanks, I'm buddy. I'm loving the new show. I checked out the first episode. What'd you think? I thought it was great. You know what? As someone who's, I've always kind of been interested in this, but I've never right. really done anything with it. Like, my dad wasn't a big Molitor, and no one in my family. My grandfather did connects. That's about <laughs> as close as I've come. So, looking into this and seeing your community, checking it out on Google+, Plus, I mean, it's awesome. You guys have tons of videos, tons of content. It's it's almost overwhelming for a noob like myself. Right, you yeah. know, it's, it's just like, wow, there's so much there. Like I posted, I don't know much, but you know what? 
if I can help in some way, I'd like to be a part of it. Right I think on. it's a great right thing on. to do. So you know, um having not built the model before, we're we're gonna take you kind of through the beginning steps. And we're we're gonna build the F one hundred pickup, the nineteen fifty three Ford. Nice. Uh, so it's uh this is gonna be our first build to show other noobs or newbies, um, <laughs> people just getting into the hobby, exactly how to get started with your first kit. Last week, as you know, we talked about tools, yep. some of the tools you'll need to, to start your build. But this week, let's jump over to the bench, see what we got, and talk a little bit about the model we're going to build. Definitely. Let's do it. Right let's get on. into it. So we're over at the bench, and these are the parts laid out. Now, we're not going to use all of these parts because we went through our instructions earlier, and as you know, we were talking about when you're looking through the instructions, you're going to kind of get an idea of what you want to build and how you may want to modify it. Now, that might be a little bit out of the scope of a, a new builder coming into the hobby, but um, this kit that we've chosen today has a multitude of ways that you can build it. You can build it three different ways. Uh, what we're going to do on this build is we're going to do a little bit of customization as we progress through the series. But we're also going to um, show you some techniques that people just coming into the hobby can learn really fast and get building right away. Nice. I'm looking forward to it, especially since we did go over the instructions. And like you showed me, there's quite a bit there, especially for someone. It's a little bit daunting. A little bit it, daunting. It can be for your first build. Now, we're obviously going to use glue to build this. And the glues that we're going to use today um, are the Testers brand glue which a lot of people will say, well, if you're a professional, you don't use that. This glue has been around for 60 years. You know, it reminds me of the glue that came in the really old sets my dad had, cement glue, right? It's right, it's, much a, it's a plastic cement it's glue. It's been around yeah. for a very long time. As long as I've been alive, it's been around at least. <laughs> yeah, and you're still young. <laughs> All right, and we're also going to use the plastic weld, uh, which is a similar type of glue, only this is a liquid glue. It's a brushable glue that you can put onto seams and through the capillary action. Uh, it will bring the parts and melt them together. So literally fuse them like a weld. So we're going to use that as well. Uh, and later on, when we go to put the glass in the model, we're going to use canopy glue, which essentially, as we were discussing earlier, is kind of like white glue that you'd find in your school supplies. Honestly, uh, not saying that I sniff glue regularly or anything, but it did <laughs> smell very, very close to just straight glue. I, I did see that. Smell that, I should say. <laughs> All right, so now we got all our parts laid out. We've looked at our instructions. We have to wash the parts. So, I mean, I get that, like, when you buy something new and you want to wash it, but what would be the reason for washing, like, a model kit like this? The reason that we want to wash the parts is because the parts, when they come from the factory, still have mold release on them. What do you mean by mold release? Mold release is a silicone release that they put into a mold when they're casting the parts, because these are all injected plastic. They are injected into a mold under high pressure, and they use a release to help get these out of the mold. Otherwise, they'd be stuck there, and the mold would be garbage. Oh, okay. That that actually makes sense. It's not mold, M-O-L-D, but mold, M-O-U-L-D. You're right. Got it. So the reason that we do that, there's two reasons that we do. One is to clean the parts, and two is so that our paint will stick a lot better when we go to put on our primer. It does look pretty shiny as it is now, so I'm guessing that's not good for getting your paint to stick. No, it's not. So okay. we want to make sure that we clean all of our parts, and we're going to do that next. What we're going to use to clean them, which is, people ask this all the time, we're going to use a little bit of dish detergent. Um, this is the Dawn brand. I like using this brand. Just a couple of drops in a tub of hot water, wash them all up. Then we're going to move on to drying them, and then we're going to lay down some primer. Nice. Nothing too fancy. I like Nothing it. Nothing too fancy, no. So you, the primer that we're going to use today is from Vallejo Paints. This is their black primer. And the reason we're using the black today is because of the color of our plastic. Now, we have other primers that are very close to this color. You were showing me earlier, actually. It was very, very close, if not lighter almost, it seemed. It, yeah, quite. it's quite a bit lighter. And it would be hard for us to find the defects in the plastic just by um, using the gray primer. So we're going to use the black so it'll help us find some of the defects, and we'll show you how we do that. We're going to use this in an airbrush today. Most people will buy primers um, in a spray can like this here. This is uh, a typical brand that a lot of modelers use. 
Um, it's very inexpensive, can be found at Walmart or most uh, major department stores. I think in the U.S. this sells for like 99 cents a can. Well, you know, within range. Yeah. yeah. Within, it, you know, in reasonable. Canada, it's it's $2.50. But this is uh, an enamel primer, and enamels have a high odor to them. Uh, and you don't want to be around enamels sniffing them in all day. No, definitely. I have to chide my girlfriend about that when she's working with chemicals all the time. Do you have you open a window? Is there ventilation? Turn the fan on. Right. You know, whatever you can do. Definitely. Absolutely. And there are steps that you can take to using enamels in your home by having a paint booth. We don't have one here at the studio, so we're going to opt for a low uh, odor solution, one that's not harmful to our health, and we're going to use the Vallejo primer. And this stuff sticks really well. I just want to say plastics. thanks for not killing us, Rich. I appreciate yeah, it. I, I thought you'd like that. <laughs> all right, so let's uh, let's get washing up the parts, and we'll head over to the paint booth. We'll get them all painted, and then we'll start building. Let's get to it. All right. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use an airbrush to lay down our primer this time, as opposed to what we were talking about earlier, using a spray can. Now you can see we've got our work area, our work surface has all been protected from overspray. We're going to use the black uh, Vallejo acrylic primer, which doesn't give off a lot of odor. And the nice thing about this primer, Alex, is that you can put this right into your airbrush without having to thin it. That's actually, I, I've been told before that that's actually a really good thing because thinning a lot of paints can be really difficult if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So you can over thin paint and then it doesn't stick very well. So what we're going to do is we're just going to drop a little bit of paint in our paint cup here. We'll just put a little bit in there. I won't lie, with no lid that almost looks dangerous. <laughs> it does almost look dangerous. But you can see we don't have a lot of paint in our paint cup. It's about half full. Okay. Um, now we're just going to test our spray. We see that we've got none, so we're just going to adjust our needle until we start seeing some spray come out. There we go. You can see the spray on the on the paper. Okay. And it's a little bit blotchy. That's better. So now what we want to do is we want to paint the part. We're going to choose the this part here. And it doesn't matter if our parts are on the table right now because uh, we're all we're going to spray them all anyway. The so, way they are. So we're not we're not actually covering anything that we don't want covered. No. Basically, we're going to spray it all down. Yeah, we're going to okay. spray it all down anyway with the same primer. So all you want to do, much like you would with uh, anything else you want to be about six to eight inches away when you just like you would with a spray can and you want to turn on and turn off the paint so let me see if I can show this so we're going to turn off turn on the paint away from the part and we're going to come across the part and you can see that we've got no paint coming out there we go I must remember it's not me using the airbrush that's right I've never done it <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start off, we're going to go across, and we're going to end off the part. Okay, so we're going to go like that. And you can see we're just getting a very light coverage. We're not trying to cover the whole thing at once. First shots, you don't want to... So, okay, I, I think I can see it now. Now, you might not see it, but Rich's finger is holding it down while he passes over, but immediately letting go. So, right. Okay. So I'm turning on the paint, away from the part, and I'm coming across, and then turning it off. And I'm trying to keep the same distance away from the part as I would if I were using a spray can. Now we're going to let that piece dry. We're going to go on to the next section. We're going to just keep painting our, our parts, and as we do, We'll come back and uh, we'll show you all the parts when they've got all their primer on them. Okay, looks awesome. All right, now we've got uh, the parts that we're going to use for our build primed and ready to go. We can see we didn't prime everything because we're not using all the parts in the kit. Which, by the way, before we even move on with that, since we're not going to use all the parts, but we kept them on the sprig and we sprayed them down, right. how difficult is it to remove the paint in case you want to use it in another kit or somewhere else? Actually, it's, it's quite easy. It's just a matter of taking your hobby knife and just scraping off the plastic, or scraping off the paint, not the plastic, I'm sorry, but scraping off the paint from where it needs to be glued. 
Oh, wow, really? Yeah. That's, that's we'll nice. demonstrate that right away when we start building the engine. Okay. Also, just something I noticed now, we didn't show it earlier, but when you were cleaning it, you put the pieces in bins. Right. Now, I noticed that some pieces fell off. So as a newbie, especially for someone like me, if you've never done it before and you're going to clean it, use the bins because you can actually catch your pieces. Don't use a sink or something like that. It seems that, like that's a little yeah. small little detail that I think is very important. Well, you're absolutely right because if you put them in a sink and you're washing them in the sink, if one of those small pieces should fall off the sprue or the tree uh then it could go down the drain and you could be without that part and you go oh man no i can't finish my kit which i have done to many things i'm sure <laughs> down the drain, just oh no so, i've seen you do it to uh, computer part <laughs> oh why did you gotta tell them about that <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case yeah we're all ready now to to start with some of our sub assemblies and we're going to build the engine first so let's get to it okay let's do it all right so we've got our parts primed we're ready to go. Let's start building. We're we're going to do the custom engine today. We're okay. going to get started on some of the sub assemblies, and uh, they're still all on the tree. Yes, which we just finished painting. Right. And I noticed here we pulled out. Well, we pulled out the manual, which is always should be like one of the first things right. you do. A lot of people I notice, you know, they talk a lot like, "Oh, you don't need a manual." I love to look at the manual for things. <laughs> how would you know how it works otherwise? Especially for something like this with all these little pieces. So, I also noticed too that you pulled out a piece of glass. I uh, did. What's yes. this about? The glass, the reason I pulled that out is because the surface primer that we used earlier to prime all these parts, we may have to go back and do a little bit of touch-up, and we'll do that with a brush. Okay. So, so we're going to use the glass. We're going to put our paint on the glass, as opposed to putting it on paper or something like that that will absorb the paint. This won't, and it'll allow it to dry. So all we got to do at the end of the day is just scrape it off. That sounds like a really good idea. So we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. So we got our instructions, we've got our parts, now we have to identify what parts that we need. Okay. Okay, and each of these parts are numbered. As you can probably see, I know I'm, I, let's put it on the camera properly. You see that all these parts are numbered. And on the sprue, there's little numbers as well on all the parts. Oh, you can still see them even after you find it, which is You nice. bet. Okay. So in this case, for the engine block, we need 21 which is right there, and 22, which is right there. So we're going to cut them off using our sprue clippers, which we talked about last week. And we'll just get in nice and close and just clip that off. And we'll just clip this one off. Now, one of the things we want to watch, because this has tabs on it, you can see that it's got these little tabs on the top. Yeah, I can see. For that. parts to fit on top of there. I see. And you'll see that we didn't quite get everywhere with our primer. So once we assemble this, we're going to come back and we're going to hit that again with a little bit of primer before we put on any more parts. Okay, so we've got our two parts. We've got a little bit of cleanup to do on these parts from where we clipped them off. You can probably, I don't know how well we can see that on camera, but you can see where we clipped them off right there. Yeah, there's a, it's definitely um, a not different primed. color. Yeah, a different yeah. color. So what we want to do is take our hobby knife. Now these are very sharp. I remember them from a kid. <laughs> yes, you can cut yourself quite easily on them. So first and foremost, I don't like to use the blade side or the sharp end because you can gouge your plastic very easily. So what I like to do is I like to use the back side and just scrape a little bit with the back side because it doesn't quite cut a lot. If you've got a little bit too much plastic, you might want to get in there and just shave it off a little bit. But don't do what I'm doing and cut towards yourself. Yes. You always want to cut away from yourself. Definitely. So here we go. We're just going to cut away because we got a little bit too much plastic in there. We've cleaned that up enough for us to be able to come back and uh, put that part together. Now, you'll notice on the we didn't spray the inside. Yeah. What? Uh, the reason the we that? didn't is because we didn't want to get paint on this area because we'd have to come back with our hobby knife or with a piece of sandpaper and scrape all of that paint off so that we get good adhesion from the glue. So the primer would interact, would keep the glue from actually forming Absolutely. Correctly? Okay. Where it's just something I definitely wouldn't have known. I probably would have just sprayed it in there and let it go and then tried to glue it and it would have started falling apart on me, wouldn't it? Have? A lot of new builders will do that. They'll just, they'll paint it and go, okay, I'm done. I'm ready to go. So now we've got our halves of our engine block. And we're going to show you how to glue those up using the tester's glue. A lot of people will buy this glue first because it's readily available. 
What a lot of people don't know is that you can glue parts together using one of those. Oh, the versatile toothpick. That's right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, I've got some extra foil here, so I'm going to take a little bit of glue. I'm just going to put it on the paper, the foil paper. And because it's foil, it doesn't absorb the glue. But this glue does start to set up fairly, fairly fast. I think we've got that on camera. I'm just going to use a toothpick. I'm going to roll it in there so I got a little bit on the end of my toothpick. And I'm going to take the half that has the indentations in it. Okay. And the first thing I like to do, and not all builders do this, is I like to fill those halves, those little indentations, because they have matching pins on the other side that you can come back and put those in. Now I'm just going to just run a little bit of glue around trying not to get it on other areas that I don't want it. And, you know, I'm not being too precise here because this is the engine. Nobody's really going to see a lot of it anyway. I just want to make sure I get the major areas. So, again, if it's the inside and people aren't looking at it, you don't got to be quite as... No, you don't. You know, but, you know, mo some builders will say, you know, you gotta you got to do it right and you, everything's got to be perfect. And if it's your first build, don't strive for perfection. Don't ever strive for perfection. Strive to get it built, first and foremost. So now we've got glue on this half. We've got no glue on this half. We're going to take the two parts. We're going to mate them up. So those little tabs that we showed earlier go together. And there we have our engine block. Now, you can see on the front here, I don't know how well the camera is going to pick that up. But on the front, we had a little bit of glue squeeze out. And I'll just use a clean toothpick so I can show you what I mean. We had a little bit of glue squeeze out right here. So we can come back and we can clean that up right away. And it doesn't, we don't end up with what's called a glue bomb. Which is, I'm guessing, glue everywhere is filling out. Which, if you right. had done both sides, I'm guessing you would have had that problem a lot more, which is why you yeah. only did one side. You want to put glue on very sparingly. You don't want to put it on uh, so that you've got way too much on your, your part. Because if you do, then it starts to seep out in the seams. And if you're trying to do a really precise job, it can really mess it up really fast. Then you have to come back after it's dry, sand it off, and then repaint the product or repaint the part. But one of the things that we're going to do when we go back and touch this up is we're going to use a toothpick after it dries up. I shouldn't have stuck that in there already. <laughs> but once it's dry, usually this glue sets up in, in a couple of hours, but it takes a good 24 hours for it to really uh, solidify okay. and make this part permanent to one another. Um, so what I like to do is, and we talked about this earlier, subassembly. So we've done the engine block now. We're going to put that aside, let it dry. If you're concerned about it coming apart because maybe the part is warped from the factory, you can use these things, our good trusty friends, the clothes peg, and just put the clothes peg on it in areas where you think it might come apart. You can also use tape, and if your clothes peg isn't big enough, like mine is not, yeah, mine's not big enough to, to go around that part. Oh, well, there it is. There we go. So now we're just going to leave that dry till tomorrow, and then we'll continue building the rest of the engine. Okay. Have you ever wanted to get light to a part of a model that you just couldn't get an LED into because it was too big or there just wasn't enough room to get that LED just to fit right or run the wires? Well, there's a solution. It's called fiber optic, and the only place to get fiber optic filament is from the fiber optic store at fiberopticstore.com. They have everything that you need to get light right where you need it, and they've got all kinds of projects over there, all kinds of tips, tricks, and hints, and they've got a great selection of fiber optic materials from multi-stranded right down to single-strand filaments as small as 0.25 of a millimeter. So go check out the Fiber Optics Store today at FiberOpticStore.com. Let's go over to Evil Duck Creations and Jay Barron as he teaches us a little bit about the art of mold making. <laughs> I am Jay Barron, owner of Evil Duck Creations, Professional Models and Props. And I'm going to talk to you today about mold making. 
There are a lot of times as a model builder that you may want to make a mold of something, whether it's to recreate a broken part or to build one and then cast several copies for detailing purposes, or you may even want to make a mold and sell something, you know, some, some product that you've made, you want to be able to mold it and sell it. There are a lot of things that you can do and a lot of reasons to make molds, but making molds can be kind of a pain. So I'm going to take you through the steps and there are two main kinds of mold making. What we're going to concentrate on today is the single mold. And that is usually a flat mold that you can pour some casting material into and get your molded piece. So let's get started on that and I'll see you over at the bench. Okay, one of the first things that you're going to want to decide before you even start making a mold is what do you want to make your final product out of? There are a lot of different choices. A few of them are right here. One thing you can use is standard epoxy. Mix up some epoxy, mix it together, pour it into the mold, and when it hardens, you've got a piece that is made from epoxy that'll work quite well. Just got to be careful with bubbles in a case like this, but there are ways to get that out. I'll talk about that in a little while. Another thing that you can use, which is becoming very popular, is acrylic powder. This is sold in a couple of different manners. The first is, most people call it dental acrylic, because you can get it as dental material. It's used for making dentures and doing dental repairs and things like that. And it's nice stuff because it's just, it's a very, very fine powder that pours in, it conforms to the inside of the mold, and then you add a little bit of the activator to it, and in five minutes it is hardened up. You have a very nice, polishable, sandable piece of plastic that you can work with. One way to get this significantly cheaper than buying it as dental material is to go to a beauty supply store or a beauty supply someplace online and get acrylic fingernail powder. It is exactly the same thing. You can get in smaller amounts. If you buy it as dental powder, very often you have to buy a large bottle and it can end up costing you in the area of, you know, $100, $90 for that bottle of one color. This stuff you can get in one ounce bottles. Uh, you, I, I put it into this particular bottle, but you can get it in one ounce sizes for around $7. Online you can get it cheaper. You get a bottle of activator. And you can get it in various different colors. White I use for making molds of things just in general. The uh, clear stuff I use for mainly for making windows and things like that inside of models that I want to light. So you can use this powder that works really well for making a mold. Alumilite is a uh, two-part resin, polyester resin, that is extremely popular. Uh, resin kits, you, you've heard of resin kits, they're made of this stuff. Alumilite, there are a lot of different types out there. I use Alumilite because it's locally available and I don't go through a ton of it so I don't buy it in huge amounts. It's more expensive when you buy it in small amounts like this, but it does have a shelf life. And if I were to buy a five gallon drum of it, I guarantee you four gallons of it would go bad before I used it. So. That's why I buy it in smaller containers. We'll be using this to make some molds a little bit later today. Okay, let's get started. We're going to make a mold, and the first kind we're going to mold making we're going to talk about is called press molding. Now, this is a cast, a resin cast of a Millennium Falcon made from an ice cube tray. It's it's supposed to be, you know, just some fun, cute little ice cubes or whatever. But press molding is done by a, a lot of people who make dolls and such, such like that will use press molding to get certain characteristics, certain uh, molds. The best thing about press molding is it's very, very fast, but it does not pull super details. So when you're doing this, you don't necessarily want to use it for something that has a lot of detail. There's a couple ways to do it. What you're going to need is some baby powder talcum powder, whatever you want to call it, talcum powder brush, and some sort of clay. This is standard modeling clay, 
And this, which is actually a better choice, is uh, it is uh, Sculpey, is what it's called. It's also known as Fimo. It is a special kind of modeling clay, modeling material, that stays flexible until you bake it in an oven. Then it hardens up like a rock. But press molding is exactly what uh, what it what it says. Put a little bit of talcum powder on the thing that you want to mold. <sighs> Get as much of it off as you possibly can. This just helps release it. Once you've got that, take a flat piece of clay, lay it on, press it on, and then pop it off. And as you can see, we've got a surprisingly well detailed little piece of uh, a piece of clay here that you can pour any of these different methods of casting into and it will give you a pretty decent mold. It, it works really well for very very flat things. If it's got undercuts and that would be well like for example if I were trying to make a mold of this bottle this area under here would be an undercut. That means that something would have to wrap around that to get that. That's very very difficult to do with the press mold method. But works actually better with a Sculpey. See now again, very nice detail, and we could use this for a one-shot. You might get two out of the Sculpey, but it's just better to do a second one if you need more than one. This is a very fast and very economical way to make a quick mold. An offshoot of the press and mold method is uh, known as molding putty. Now molding putty comes in two parts and uh, one is usually white, another is either blue or purple or whatever. And what you do is you take a small amount, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to need that much, there's a little bit, you want another piece from the other type as close to that size as you can get it. That's pretty good. This is a product also sold by Illuminite. Other companies manufacture this. This is also very, very good for making molds. The nice thing about this is it will deal with undercuts to a degree and it will uh, it'll give you a permanent mold. You can get a lot of castings out of it. It's a little bit pricey but, and it does have a shelf life, but it has a longer shelf life than uh, well, uh, silicone molding, which we'll get into next. But this is uh, actually a type of silicone molding, but this is a very good product. You can find it at a lot of hobby stores and such. What you want to do is you just take these two parts and mix them up really well until they are a uniform color. There are no streaks of any kind. See now this still has streaks of white in it or streaks of purple. Get it in camera so you can actually see it. So it needs to be mixed more. This will heat up a little bit as you mix it but it'll heat up more when it is finally uh, molding and casting and such. So what we have now, you can see it's a uniform color, and it's a lot like silly putty is what it feels like. So, we have here a uh, 1950s style ray gun. And I have this one that I've made, but I want to make another one. This part up here is made from several different pieces. And I don't have another one of this little ridged piece around here. So I can make a mold of this and then I can use that for making the second piece. And again, just like with press molding, you just press this on. But the nice thing is you can press it on and squeeze it around. You want to gently squeeze it, but the idea is to try to press out as much of the air as you possibly can. 
until this has been wrapped around and molded and you can see it's all around here a little bit more down here and now we just set that aside in about a half an hour this will have hardened up and we can use it for actually making a casting okay it's been a half an hour and as you can see this material has hardened up very well very dense and here's the nice thing it just pops off and as you can see we've got every little detail in here that's been pulled in now there are a couple of little places where there are bubbles but those can be sanded off when I make the final mold so molding putty is a great way to do a quick mold of something uh, again if you just need a couple of them it works really well again it's not as detailed of a mold pull as what you would get from RTV silicone which I'll show you next but molding putty works really well and it lasts a long time I've had this for over a year and it still works the one thing about mold putty is the older it gets the longer it takes to set up sometimes it'll set up in 10 minutes now it's taking about a half an hour I've seen it take over an hour if for some reason it doesn't seem to be setting up as quickly as it could be if the model can take it you can immerse it in warm tap water that helps speed up the process okay on to the big guns this is Alumalite RTV silicone rubber I got from Hobby Lobby it's a one pound container this cost about thirty dollars again it has a shelf life so that's why I buy small amounts inside here you have the container of mold making rubber base the catalyst which you add to this in order to activate the RTV and make it solid a measuring cup which is useless some other types of measuring cups which are slightly less useless and some mixing sticks we'll use those okay I want to make a mold of whoops dropped it I want to make a mold of this piece that I built sorry this piece that I built I've made a dam to go around it out of this plastic serving cup because that ends up giving me uh, a nice shape to go around it and it'll help me not use too much to figure out how much RTV silicone I need to mix I'm going to use another cup to mix it in and I'm going to use some table salt <clears throat> what you want to do is fill up your mold with table salt to the point where you know you've got enough in there see a little bit of gray is showing so I need to go a little higher so I know that I've got enough that's more than enough to give me proper mold that will be thick enough I pour this in here no salt left in there and I know now that if I put in this much RTV I will have enough to do the mold that I want to make okay so salt is all out of there I'm going to pour in some of the RTV that's some salt sticking on the outside because I spilled it like an idiot okay get up get in there and you can see the stuff is very thick in order to properly add the catalyst you need to add 10 percent by weight easiest way to do that is with an inexpensive measuring or an inexpensive uh, scale that amount weighs 35 grams so I need to add about four grams of catalyst you shake up the catalyst very well pour some in I'm gonna add a little bit more it doesn't have to be exact bring it up to 40 
doesn't have to be an exact amount, but you want to get it close. I've worked with this stuff enough to know, okay, that'll work. If you add more catalysts, it'll set up faster, but it may not do what you want. It may, it may set up too quickly. Stir this up. There is no way to stir this up and avoid getting bubbles in it. But I will show you how to keep the bubbles from showing up. Okay, this has all been mixed up, and it is, as you can see, loaded with bubbles. One way that people do to keep the bubbles from showing up is to pour it into the mold from very, very, very high up. This helps break up the bubbles as they hit, but I've always found that method doesn't necessarily work as well. The best way to do it is if you have access to some sort of a vacuum chamber. Most people think, I can't afford a vacuum chamber. I don't have a vacuum chamber. What can I do? Well, the truth of the matter is, you might have one at home and just not know about it. This is a food saver container, which is used for vacuuming, vacuum saving leftovers and things like that. You can use this as a vacuum chamber by putting ladder molds on there, taking either your food saver unit or you can even, yeah, there's, there's little hand versions of this that you can use, and just hitting canister, and this is sucking the air out of this which will force the bubbles to the top and break. off on its own. Oh yeah, it even sucked a little bit of it out. So, with this, will not get that, that'll pop right off, so no problem. This is sealed up, it's pulled the bubbles out, and now I'm just going to let that sit for, in this particular case, about six hours. And next time, we will unmold that, and we will start casting. So until then, I will see you later. Here's Danny Monahan with our tip of the week. Hi, guys, and welcome back. And today's quick tip is going to be about masking. Have you ever gotten to a project where you're doing multiple colors or tones on the same model kit, and... You just don't have the right sort of masking material, tape's too tacky, even if you run it across your, your pant leg too many times, it's still pulling up your paint. Well, here's a quick tip for you. I like to use blue tack, that's what it's called in England, but in the States you can get it as Loctite Fun Tack. Uh, it's a, a, a very low adhesive putty, and uh, what you can do is you can simply just take it and put it wherever you want to mask off. For example, on this model tank, I'm going to put it here. Got my brush, excuse the noise, grab some paint, give it a quick spray, and you're done. And the best thing is, when you pull it up, it did not pull up the paint. There you go, guys. That's a quick paint. There's a good little quick tip for you. From my bench to yours, I wish you all the best and have fun. Now, are you one of those model builders that likes to have reference material around his home? Well, there's no better reference material on the web right now than Video Workbench. My good friend Jason Garris has a full line of instructional DVDs that is available to you right now over at videoworkbench.com. Everything from the basics right through to advanced airbrushing techniques and so, and a whole lot more. So I want you to go out and check out videoworkbench.com. And if there's something there that you think you can use in your library, then I would contact Jason Garris over there and get yourself a copy of one of his fantastic DVDs. That's videoworkbench.com. And now it's time to talk about some glue and why we use the glue that we use.
You know, the one question we get asked the most on our community is, what is the best glue? And there's no real easy answer to that. There's so many glues out there that you can use for scale model building, whether you're building wood, things that are metal, a combination of materials, styrene, wood, metal, cloth. There's all kinds of different glues to use. So what I want to do is take you into the world of glue for a moment and explain why we use so many different glues. So let's go over to the bench and uh, look and see what we've got on the table. So as you can see on the table, we have a variety of different glue, and you're probably wondering, why do we have so many different glues? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First, because they all do different things and in, di in different ways. And depending on the type of model that you're building or the type of um, uh, products you're putting onto the model, such as photo etch or lighting, you may want to use some of these glues. Let's start with the most common glue, and that's this glue by Testers. This is a plastic cement. It's a, um, a thicker uh, consistency cement. So it's very much like, uh, it's about the same consistency of, say, an Elmer's glue. Um, it will not stick your skin together. However, if you put a little dab between your fingers, you can make what we used to call, uh, as kids, angel hair. And that'll get stuck to everything. Um, but what this is designed to do is it's designed to melt the plastic together. It takes two pieces of styrene and literally fuses them by chemically melting the plastic together. So it's a, it's a good starter glue. Some people will tell you professionals don't use this. Well, you know what I say? Everybody uses this. For one reason or another, they still use it. So uh, get yourself a, a thing of testers. Testers is not a sponsor of the show. Um, but get yourself some testers when you're starting out that, that model. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good glue to have. Now, next up, we have Plastruct Plastic Weld. Now, this glue is a liquid, and you can see that it, it's quite thin, and, and uh, it's run. It comes with a applicator built right onto it. It's a little brush. And what you do with this is you take two pieces of styrene or plastic, and um, this is a good example where two pieces come together, and you can just run a bead down the seam line. I don't know how well we can see that, but we can run a bead down the seam line, and what it does is the capillary action of the glue seeps into the area between two pieces of plastic and, again, chemically bonds the plastic together. So a uh, good, uh, good glue to have. Now, both of these glues will not work very well with clear styrene. Uh, what they'll tend to do is they'll tend to frost it. Um, it's easy to get prints on your, on your clear plastic parts, so... Uh, it's not recommended that you use either one of these to uh, adhere clear parts to your model kit, okay? All right, so next up, we have two different kinds of cyanoacrylate glue. And we have a super thin, which is very similar in consistency to the plastic weld um, glue that we showed you. And this stuff here is a super glue essentially crazy glue for all intent and purposes and everybody knows that name uh you'll want to use this when you're when you want to get two parts together very quickly um it cures quite quickly as well uh if you want to accelerate the curing time you can use a product like instaset and what this does is it is for all ca glues and this will cure um or harden up your ca quite fast so this is a a good glue to use when you're trying to get parts together really quickly and you don't want them to pop apart, uh, this is a, a good glue to use. Or if you want to put on uh, mismatched material parts, such as photo etch, which is brass to plastic, uh, you may want to use CA to adhere that to your model. And the other CA that we have, this is what, they, what is known as a gap filling glue. It's quite thick. Um, and there are tubular applicators, pin applicators, very much like this one, uh, that you can put on the top of these so you can get your glue out. And you can buy other applicators. I keep dropping this. Um, you can buy other applicators so that, uh, you can, um, always have a clean tip as it were. 
And this glue is good for filling gaps if your if your parts tend to come apart. Um, this will help to fill the gap so you don't have to put a lot of putties or, or things like that between uh, the two parts. This is a good glue for that. Again, you can accelerate it with the InstaSet. Um, two very good products. These are distributed by PM Hansen in Canada, and uh, they can be found at uh, most hobby good hobby stores. Now we have Formula 560 Canopy Glue. There's also another one out there called Crystal Clear. And this is typically used to take a clear part and adhere it to a standard colored part. Uh, what this does, although this does not chemically bond the clear to the other plastic, it does take the the plastic, the clear plastic piece, piece and glue it down. Now, it's not meant for handling. Um, so once you get that piece glued down and in place, leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't bump it. Don't. You know, run around the house flying your plane or zooming your car across the, the carpet. Um, because this won't hold it in permanently. What it does is it gives you enough adhesion so that you can get that canopy down on your, your plane and it won't frost the glass or, or chemically scar the glass. So this is a very good glue to use. You can also use Elmer's White Glue. This is very similar to Elmer's White Glue. It's a little bit of a different formulation, but I know a lot of people have used Elmer's White Glue as well. Now, Formula 560, as well as uh, Crystal Clear, which is the same type of, of formulation, uh, w is available at most hobby stores. And you can also use it to fill window holes. If you're building a Starship or a boat or something along that line that has a lot of windows in it, you can use this glue to fill the windows hole, window holes. And we're going to show you that in an upcoming episode as we fill windows on a larger vehicle or a larger model. Now, Five-minute epoxy. You're probably wondering, why the heck would you want five-minute epoxy? Well, sometimes you want to get really good adhesion on a part. And you don't want to use this stuff, but you do want to make sure that that part's not going to come apart. So five-minute epoxy, you can see that it comes in a two-part uh, squeeze bottle. You can also get it in two-part bottles like this. Uh, that you mix together. What this does is it dispenses equal amounts onto a tray. You just kind of mix it up with a toothpick, and you can uh, glue your parts. And this doesn't add any extra heat, unlike CA glues. Um, so if you're gluing down wires inside of a model because you're lighting it or something along that line, this is really good glue to use. You can also use hot glue. Uh, I don't recommend hot glue unless you're using a low-temp hot glue. Uh, to put down wires and, and mount LEDs and that sort of thing. Um, just because the heat of the gun can scar the plastic or warp the plastic. And if you started to paint that prior to assembly, you could be in trouble. So uh, I like the five-minute epoxy. You've always got time to wait on something when you're building a model, so why not use five-minute epoxy? Uh, for those people that are impatient, of course, you're going to try and use a uh, CA. I don't recommend using a CA on wires because... Um, what typically will happen over time is that if you close up a model, and I've heard this happening, um, the fumes will cause uh, wires to break, become brittle, and then you lose the connection between your light and your power source. So a good five-minute epoxy, just mix them up, put, it on, put a dab in, drop your, your wires in or drop uh, uh, your other parts on. Five-minute epoxy is great for adhering photo etch as well. You just want to put it on very, very smooth. So there you have it. There's all the glues. Check them all out. There's all kinds of them out there. Uh, I have a variety of them, as you can see. And uh, I recommend that uh, if you're going to get into the scale model building hobby, then by all means, get yourself a good variety of glues, and you can find them at any good hobby store or at any department store. In this week's Google Plus Community Spotlight, we look at Sci-Fi Annecy. Sci-Fi Annecy is a community group that focuses on science fiction modeling and it's run by kenny conklin so if you have not gone over and checked it out and you're a sci-fi model builder there's some great people over there very talented people they're ready to answer your questions and take part in what you're building in a way that you could never imagine so i would suggest that you go over to kenny conklin's google plus community called sci-fi annecy they're serving the universe of modelers 
Hey, if you're looking to find us around the web, well, it's not that hard. You can check us out on Google Plus at our community, Amazing Plastic. You can find us on the World Wide Web at AmazingPlastic.com. Over there, you're going to find articles, tips, tricks, and this show right here, Amazing Plastic Scale Model Show, Uh, as well as you can find us on Facebook. We're also on Twitter, and we have a YouTube channel which really doesn't contain the show, but it does contain a little bit of extra stuff that you may want to check out from time to time. You can get a high-quality version of this show for download from our website at AmazingPlastic.com. So comment, like us, and share us around the web. Tell your friends that this is the place to be for all your modeling news and how-tos. Wow, it was a full show. Alex? coming by and asking all kinds of questions about how to get into scale model building. That was great. It was nice to see that we, our community is getting involved with the show. Uh, Our how to section with Jay Barron from evil duck creations. I want to thank him for sending his segment along. And uh, if you want to know more about molding or more about Jay Barron and evil duck creations, go check them out at our Google plus community site. And that is amazing plastic on Google plus Uh, as well. uh, I want to thank Nick Ambergie and his rat rod. What a great build that was. It was so fantastic that I got to see more stuff that he's built and he is, he's just an excellent builder and I'm sure you're going to enjoy seeing more from Nick Ambergie. Ambergie as time goes by as well. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Danny Monahan for our tip of the week this week. And I want to thank you, the viewer, for joining us and checking us out here on the World Wide Web at AmazingPlastic.com and checking out our Google Plus community and becoming a member. There's a lot of great people over there. There's a lot of great things to learn. And if you've got a question, there's a lot of great people that can answer it for you as well. So until next time, I want to see you at the bench and keep on building.